Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's House on this the third Sunday after Pentecost. If we look at our lives and the world around us, so often it's easy to think that we're losing and the devil is winning. And yet this turmoil is exactly what God said would happen way back in the Garden of Eden after the fall into sin. There God declared that until the end of time, hostility would exist between the devil and mankind. But God promised more than that. He promised that from mankind would come one who would completely defeat the devil. And so our theme today is, the devil does his worst, but Jesus always wins. And his victory is our victory. Let's begin with our opening hymn, 556, All Mankind Fell in Adam's Fall. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. 
He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Of the day, 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock, and more than every wild animal. You shall crawl on your belly, and you shall eat us all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our psalm today, Psalm 130b. Remember your mercy, O Lord. And on their hand. 
They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The last of the dead did not receive, did not live until the thousand years came to an end. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Instead, they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand for the gospel acclamation.
at this morning is our first lesson that we've heard read. Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Sometimes a question is just a question. A husband pulls out his cell phone while in Walmart to call his wife to say, where are you? He simply wants to know where she is in the store so he can find her. It's just a question. But sometimes a question isn't just a question, is it? A mother enters a room to find her three-year-old coloring on the wall. She asks her child, what are you doing? Now that's more than a simple question, is it? The mom knows exactly what that child is doing. The question is more than a question. When it comes to the questions that the Lord asks of us as people, usually they are questions of that second kind, the kind that are more than just questions. For example, the question that we hear the Lord ask Adam in Genesis chapter 3, where are you? Did the Lord ask that question because he simply wanted to know where Adam was? Of course not. God is omniscient. He's present everywhere. He's, um, he's uh, omnipresent. No, uh, he's omniscient, knowing all things. Omnipresent, present everywhere. The Lord knew exactly where Adam was. When the Lord asked, where are you, it's more than a question about physical location. The Lord already knew that. When he asked, where are you, he wants to know do you know? <laughs> Do you know where you are? And that's what makes this question God to ask, ask and the answer to it so important for Adam and Eve and also for us as well. So this morning God asked you and me, where are you? So why did God even have to ask this question? Because Adam and Eve decided they were going to try to hide from God. Now that was the first. They never had to hide from God before. Created in his image, Adam and Eve had a, a perfect relationship with God. They had perfect knowledge of God and of his will. And they lived in perfect harmony with him up until now. They delighted in God's presence. But no longer. Now they were trying to hide from him. But why? What had changed? They had changed. God had not changed. Adam and Eve changed when they exchanged the truth of God for a lie of Satan. They lost the image of God. They, they sinned by disobeying God. And in so doing, they destroyed that perfect relationship with God. Their love for God turned to hatred of and fear of God. They were no longer in harmony with God, but hostile to Him. So they cowered in fear as they heard God approaching. And they foolishly thought that they could hide from Him. Now they were enemies of God, ashamed and afraid of the punishment. They knew they rightly deserved for violating God's clear command. Now sinful in their sin-warped thinking, they believed that hiding behind some trees would actually keep God from finding them. And they foolishly, foolishly imagined that by their own efforts they could protect themselves from God's just condemnation. But when God came to find our first parents, we noticed he didn't come to punish them. He came to offer them something better, to offer them a victory instead of a defeat. God knew full well where Adam and Eve were, but he wanted them to know where they were now. Though still in Eden, Adam and Eve were no longer in paradise. They were far from God, separated from God, standing with Satan, now living in the land of sin and fear and death. Where are you? It was a call to repentance. In his law, God calls to each one of us 
with that same question, where are you? Are you inside the circle with Jesus? Or are you outside without him? Do you trust in the Lord above all things? Are you putting your trust in things which are seen, which are temporary, or in things that are unseen and eternal? Do you rely on the Lord more than anyone or anything else? Do you love the Lord above all things? Is he more near and dear to you than anyone or anything else? Is it is his word and his work your chief priority? Or have you allowed other things or people to take the top part in your heart and life? Your spouse, your kids, friends, your job, your paycheck, the things you can buy, your savings account, the 401k, your pension, or other investments, your hobbies, your sports, or other interests? Do you place God's word and command above that of every, anyone else, including yourself? So how do you and I answer these questions? Do we come right out and admit we are sinners? Do we confess that we haven't kept the very first of God's commands, let alone any of the rest? Or do we refuse to look in the mirror and we try to hide our sin from God? Sadly, all too often we take after our first parents, don't we? God gave them an opportunity to repent. But their response only demonstrated how quickly sin is followed by foolishness and pride. And how often doesn't our sin warp thinking lead us to do the same? To think that if we hide or cover up our sin, somehow God's not going to find out. And when we are confronted with the reality of sin, how often don't we foolishly think we can do something to protect ourselves from God's righteous condemnation? That's what Adam did. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Adam didn't even answer God's question, did he? All he did was display how sinful he was by lying and making up an excuse. Adam says the reason he's hiding from God is because he's too modest to be seen naked by God and basically blames God for invading his privacy. But Adam knew full well what caused his fear and why he was suddenly being bothered by being naked when it never bothered him before. And yet the very sinfulness which he is openly displaying didn't allow him to openly confess it. And when lying and making excuses didn't work, then it was time to play the blame game. Point the finger and pass the blame to someone else. God wasn't buying Adam's story one bit. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And you know how Adam responds, right? Rather than confessing his sin, he says, the woman you gave to be with me. She gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. First Adam throws his wife under the bus to save himself. Sound familiar? How many times haven't you and I blamed other people for things we've done? Mom or dad sees that broken lamp and asks who did it and what happened? You know. The fingers start pointing every which way, right? Not me. She did it. Not me. He did it. He started it. She started it. And when we're older, maybe we're not so obvious, but it amounts to the same. Yeah, I, I said, yes, what I said was mean, but man, she deserved it because of what she said to me. Or we say stuff like, the devil made me do it. That was Eve's excuse, wasn't it? But when you get right down to it, who were Adam and Eve really blaming? They were really blaming God. The woman you gave to be with me. And otherwise, don't blame me, God. After all, you're the one who gave me this no good-for-nothing woman. And the serpent deceived me. In other words, don't blame me, God. After all, you're the one who created this good-for-nothing snake. 
And how often don't we do the same things? Don't blame me, God. Why'd you put me in this situation in the first place? Yet in spite of all the foolish efforts to hide from God and evade their responsibility, the question still remains, where are you? We can't get away from it. God keeps asking. He sees through all the cover-ups, all the excuses, all the finger-pointing, all the blaming. And both Adam and Eve finally, when all is said and done, have to admit their sin, don't they? They both have to say, I ate. And when God says, where are you, there's nothing for us to say either, but I did it. Here am I, a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Some questions are just questions. But some questions have a greater purpose behind them that we could ever imagine. Adam and Eve were really beyond healthy at this point, weren't they? At least from a human's point of view. God had said concerning that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on the day that you eat of it, you will certainly die. And that's exactly what happened, didn't it? No, they didn't drop dead on the spot. And yes, the germ of physical death was now within them. They one day would breathe their last, but that day was still far in the future. For Adam, it was 930 years in the future. And nevertheless, they had died. The wages of sin is death, and in the moment they sinned, they died. They died spiritually. They were separated spiritually from God and all his blessings. And the reason they try to hide from God and keep lying and blaming him is because now, honestly, that's all they can really do. At that moment, Adam and Eve deserved to stay dead. They deserved to stay dead spiritually until they die physically and then die eternally separated from God and separated from the joys of heaven forever and hell. That's what they deserve. And yet what does God do? Instead of judging them immediately and sending them straight to eternal death, God comes to them in the garden in his grace. God asks them where they are, not out of a desire to damn them, but out of a desire to save them. He comes and calls to them to tell them that he would rescue them and restore them to a right relationship with him. And it is so to this very day. The question God asks, well, where are you? Is a call to repentance and ultimately an invitation to comfort. God wants Adam and Eve and us to hear what he is about to say next. Instead of cursing Adam and Eve, he curses the Satan but that serpent. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock and more than every wild animal. You shall crawl on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. You see, God came to Adam and Eve and asked them, where are you ultimately? So that they would see where they were and their need for what he was about to say next. The promise he was about to share with them. The promise of the Savior. The very first promise of the Savior. Here God's words, although they're directed at the serpent, are really a, 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 are addressed to Adam and Eve. He, he's talking to Satan who took the form of that serpent. But he, he wants Adam and Eve to hear them. Though God spoke these words to Satan, he spoke them for Adam and Eve. He wanted them to know that he would act on their behalf to give them a victory they couldn't win. And a victory they didn't deserve. He told them he would take it upon himself to repair the damage they had done by their disobedience. He told them that he would put hostility back where it belongs. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, they stood with God and his holy angels against all that was evil. 
But when they listen to and follow the devil, they move to the opposite side. With the fallen devil and the fallen angels. So God declared he would give hostility back where it belonged between the devil and his seed, unbelievers, and the woman and her seed, believers. But how? Through the one seed of the woman. Through one particular male descendant of Eve. He would crush the serpent's head under his foot. He would destroy Satan's power permanently, though in the process, that seed of the woman's heel would be crushed too. God fulfilled this by sending his son into the world. Jesus is that promised seed of the woman. The true God from eternity and time, Jesus became true man, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, to defeat the devil and destroy his work. And at that battle of the ages on the cross, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, struck Jesus' heel. Jesus' suffering and death on the cross was real. It was painful. Jesus not only endured the physical agony of crucifixion, but the torments of all the hell that we deserve for our sins. But at the same time, Jesus' suffering and death was not permanent. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And by the power of his death and resurrection, Jesus crushed the serpent's head. By his death, Jesus bound the strong man and plundered the house of hell, not only taking back from Satan many who had been possessed physically by his minions, but also freeing countless more from his spiritual control. For by his death, Jesus disarmed the devil. He took away his weapons, unforgiven sin, and the threat of death. Jesus tied the devil up, so to speak, so that the devil can do no more than a vicious dog on a chain. We heard about that in our second lesson, the thousand years is the New Testament era in which we now live. Satan is bound by the gospel. He cannot defeat the gospel. And by his resurrection, Jesus declares his victory over sin and death and the power of the devil for us. God promised to send the promised seed of the woman to take away mankind's sin, to remove the fear of death, to destroy the devil's work, and restore their life with God. And it's by the power of this promise, the promise made and kept in Jesus, that the Lord, the God of all grace and mercy, restored Adam and Eve's relationship with him. And also restores our relationship with him. After this promise is given, we see a different Adam and Eve, don't we? An Adam and Eve who have been brought from death to life. An Adam and Eve who instead of hating and fearing God, once again, love and trust God. We see evidence of that a little later in this chapter 3, where Adam named his wife Eve. You would think he would have named her death, but Eve means life. He didn't name her death, but life. Since Eve would be, in a very sense, the mother of all subsequent living beings. The one whom God promised would restore including the one who God promised would restore life in his fullest sense, he would be her descendant. In giving his wife the name Eve, Adam showed his faith in the promise that God had spoken. This love for God and trust in God to keep his word were created by God's invitation to comfort in this very first gospel promise. In love, the Lord God still comes to call sinners like us today. Where are you? Through his word, he calls to convict us so that we know where we really are as sinners, far away from God in the land of sin and shame and fear and death. But through his word, he also calls to comfort us, assuring us that he's kept his promise to send that seed of the woman to crush the power of sin and Satan forever, to provide the Satan who would bridge the distance between the Holy God and human sinners and bring us back to him. So when God comes to you and me in his word and asks, where are you? 
We don't have to hide. We don't have to cover up our sin. We don't have to make excuses. We don't have to play the blame game. We can skip over all that garbage and just confess our sin. Just come clean and say, I admit it. I did it. We can confess our sin in the worship service with a true heart, a sincere heart, an honest heart that sees our sins as God sees them, as the evil they are. We can make use of private confession if there's a specific sin that's bothering you, some sin that maybe you've been trying to hide for a while, and now you really want to deal with it. You can come to myself or Minister Dan and confess that sin privately and confidentially. We can confess our sins with the understanding that the call to confess and repent is really God's invitation to comfort. The comfort of God's grace and forgiveness in Christ. The comfort of knowing that all our sins have been washed away in His holy precious blood and that we didn't do a thing to earn or deserve it. The call to confess and repent is the call to comfort of having God give us His own answer to that question. Where are you? God's answer is Jesus, who suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous to the, for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. At one time you were alienated from God and hostile in your thinking, as expressed through your evil deeds, but now Christ reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you holy, blameless, and faultless before him. While we are sinners, who deserve to be separated by God in hell forever, by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus, we are also the redeemed, the restored, the forgiven members of God's forever family. You are Jesus' brother, Jesus' sister, Jesus' mother. Some questions are just questions. Some questions are more than questions. But this question, where are you? along with God's answer to that question, ultimately, is the only question in the world that really matters. Amen. Please stand. Have we heard God's word this morning? We confess our Christian faith in the words of the earliest Christian creed, the Apostles' Creed, a page 181 in your hymnal or on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time we continue with the prayer of the church. In our prayers this morning, we said a prayer on behalf of the sister of Marie Federhoff, who is going in for uh, surgery this week. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we believe your word and we cry out to you. Strengthen us in our weakness and renew us day by day. We wait for you, Lord. We wait for you. And in your word, we put our hope. By your life, death, and resurrection, you have won the victory over Satan. In your ministry, you drove out demons. Protect and strengthen us against the devil's power, lies, and temptations. We wait for you, Lord. We, we wait, wait for you. And in your word, we put our hope. Let your word of grace spread to more and more people. Bind Satan and free those who live in darkness and fear that they may walk in the light of your love and thanksgiving. All to your glory. We wait for you, Lord. We wait for you. And in your word, we put our hope. Lord Jesus, look on your people who are oppressed and persecuted because of their faith. Guide the nations of the earth, that your people may freely worship and proclaim your kingdom. We, we wait, wait for you, Lord. We wait, wait for you. 
and in your word we put our hope. Work in us with your word, that we do not lose heart, but encourage one another with your word and promise of grace. We wait for you, Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we put our hope. Have mercy on those afflicted with trouble, sickness, or pain. Today especially we pray for Janet, the sister of Marine Federhoff, who goes in for surgery. We ask that you be with her, and we commend her into your care as she undergoes this surgery. We pray that you would grant success to the surgery, and also bring about a full and speedy recovery. With the message of your grace, make their troubles light and momentary, and keep their eyes on your eternal glory. We wait for you, Lord. We wait for you. And in your word, we put our hope. And listen, Lord, to the thoughts and cares of our hearts. Mighty Son of God, you came to crush the head of the serpent and to destroy the works of the devil. With your almighty arm, defend us. Do not let Satan have any power over us. Continue to bless us with your love and defend us, for you are our unconquerable God and Lord, praised forever. Amen. At this time, we collect our thank offering to the Lord. During this time, we sing our offering hymn, creating you.
you can welcome into God's house this morning. If you haven't done so already, uh, please uh, fill out the little few card or few um, card, I guess that's the word for it, um, even though you tear it off the pad. Uh, the red side is for uh, guests or visitors, uh, black side is for uh, grace members, uh, and uh, uh, you can hand that to the usher on your way out as you're being dismissed. Um, next week we begin a summer sermon series on the Lord's Prayer uh, entitled Lord Teach Us to Pray. Um, we'll uh, take a look at prayer in general but then specifically at the various uh, petitions of the Lord's Prayer the, as well as the address and the closing part the doxology and uh, uh, learn from God's Word uh, to pray more frequently and fervently and also more confidently. Uh, Bibles and Bowling begins this week, uh, grade 6 to 12, uh, June 12th at 5 p.m. at the Curvis Teen Center um, for Bible study and a game of bowling. Um, $3 for bowling, a dollar if you're a member of the youth center. Um, youth are invited to bring a friend. Um, and that'll meet pretty much almost almost every Wednesday during summer at 5 p.m. Uh, Fourth of July, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, instead of being in the parade, we're going to be at the parade. <laughs> uh, we're going to have a, a tent, a table, uh, passing out some bottled water, popcorn, and invitations to worship. Uh, so um, we need helpers to do that. So uh, if you are, want more information or you want to volunteer or both, uh, talk to me or talk to Minister Dan, and we'll be glad to uh, let you know. Remember our Monday night service uh, started last week. We were off to a good start with 30. If you know someone that uh, wasn't able to make it to church today, uh, remind them that they don't have to miss out on the one thing needed. Uh, they can come tomorrow night at 6.30. Uh, we'll be meeting 6.30 Monday all the way through uh, August. Um, and uh, summer family Bible time begins today. Uh, a video-based presentation of the lesson, which is the gospel lesson for today. And uh, after we all watch that, uh, then the kids will be dismissed uh, to do an activity or a coloring page and then uh, the rest of us will so, uh, dig in a little bit more into that um, gospel lesson for today. So um, I think that's about it. Um, God go with you as you continue to remember uh, when God asks you, where are you? It's a call to repentance and a call, an invitation to his comfort in Christ. Have a blessed day.